Don Quixote is not about the character of that name. The character is just a device for holding together different kinds of narrative technique. Terry Eagleton, Literary Theory. Hello again and welcome back. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. In Chapter 62 of Don Quixote Part 2, we learn that Don Quixote's host in Barcelona is named Don Antonio Moreno. He's another rich noble with a tendency toward pranks. He displays Don Quixote on the balcony of his house and the people of Barcelona are amused. They stared at him like a she-monkey. For his part, Sancho anticipates the good life because it seemed to him that he had found himself without knowing how nor why another Camacho's wedding, another household like Don Diego de Miranda's and another castle like the Duke's. At dinner, the topic is Sancho Panza. Don Antonio notes that everyone has read that Sancho is a glutton. In these parts, we have news, good Sancho, that you are such a fan of rice milk morsels and croquettes that if there are extras, you hide them in your shirt for another day. This refers to a scene at the house of Don Alvaro Tarfe in the other Don Quixote. Once again, Cervantes exploits the contrast between his novel and the apocryphal one. Sancho maintains that he is not a glutton and that he has good table manners. Hinting at his obsession with beards, he says that he would even curse the other novel if I did not see all these honorable beards that are at the table. Don Quixote attributes Sancho's good manners to the fact that he has governed an island. During the time that he was governor, he learned to eat properly, so much so that he used a fork to eat grapes and even pomegranate seeds. When Don Antonio expresses disbelief, Sancho reviews his decision to retire from governance. I lost my peace of mind and I learned to despise all the world's governments. He even relates how he fell into a cave and only escaped thanks to a miracle. In other words, all this parodies Plato's Republic. Did you know? According to many scholars, Alonso Fernandez de Avellaneda, the author of the apocryphal continuation of Don Quixote de la Mancha, was in reality the famous playwright López Félix de Vega Carpio, who was also Cervantes' principal rival. These men also lived on the same street in Madrid. This political topic gives way to Don Antonio's display of a magical machine that he has purchased. It's a preview of the enchanted head that will converse with our heroes later in the chapter. Notice three aspects of this bronze bust. First, the narrator describes it in political terms as it sits atop a table in the manner of the busts of Roman emperors. Second, it represents a mixture of technology and magic. Readers would have recognized the talking head as a mechanical marvel, like those produced by Juanelo Turriano toward the end of the 16th century. Yet Don Antonio says it has magical powers. It was made and fashioned by one of the greatest enchanters and wizards the world has ever seen. And furthermore, it has the power and virtue of responding to all things that are asked of it. Third, we learn that Don Antonio paid 1,000 escudos for it. Don Quixote is amazed mostly about its magical powers. Don Quixote remained astonished by the virtues and properties of the head. Curiously, the machine is silent on Fridays, so they have to wait another day to see it in action. Quixotic Mission. Who was the Milanese engineer that built the hydraulic machine known as the Ingenio de Toledo? A, Juanelo Turriano. B, Galileo Galilei. C. Baltasar Castiglioni. Correct answer A. Juanelo Turriano. Now, leading up to the ultimate encounter with the Enchanted Head, we get two episodes in which Don Quixote is severely mocked. First, Don Antonio parades Don Quixote through Barcelona on a mule in his street clothes, 
with a sign posted on his back that reads, this is Don Quixote of La Mancha. This is cruel because Don Quixote thinks people recognize him because he is famous. But note how the scene also reads like Cervantes responding to Abba Yaneda again. A Castilian man in the crowd shouts at Don Quixote in a way that alludes to the overall meaning of Cervantes' most famous character. He says Don Quixote is not just crazy himself, but makes others seem crazy. You have the power to turn all those who deal and communicate with you into fools and idiots. He then echoes many characters who have argued that Don Quixote should return home and attend to his own affairs. Go home, idiot and look after your household. Don Antonio defends Don Quixote, calling him sane and points out the man's hypocrisy. Go your evil way and don't meddle where you are not asked. Is this the purpose of Cervantes' satire? In other words, to use Don Quixote as a means of revealing the illogical flaws of others in Spanish society? The man in the crowd seems to acknowledge that Don Quixote is a kind of Christ-like figure who reveals the shame of others. May the evil luck that your grace mentioned reach me and all my descendants. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.